and welcome back to Spin Your Jaw. On this episode I'm joined by a world class athlete who was a pinnacle part of really changing the attitudes towards female fighters. She was the first ever female to compete at the 2012 Olympic Games, the games we've seen so many of our generation's greats emerge from. Tasha, thank you so much for joining us on this episode. I was really, really looking forward to seeing you and Terry fight in March. Not only was it two women at the top of their game, it was also for a world title fight, and it was the first televised card headlined by two British women, which for women in sport is just incredible. So mentally, physically, and kind of financially, how has that been having that postponed by three months? It is a mad little time. It's crazy. It's unprecedented. I think, you know, I could, I can't bog myself down too much about it. I just have to get on. It, it is what it is. I have no control over, over it. So um, mentally I'm okay. Physically, I think, obviously, I only had seven weeks to prepare for the, the first time. And I think with it being a longer time, I've just got, just got more time to prepare myself physically. Um, emotionally, the only emotional thing is being a teacher to my little girl. Apart from that, you know, it hasn't been too rough. But, you know, I'm one of the lucky fighters who, who are supported financially by sponsors. And, and, and I'm, I'm only a, a self-employed person. And if you don't work like everybody else who's self-employed, you don't get paid. So... You know, financially it is it is tough, but you know, like I say, I'm one of the lucky uh, boxers to to be able to say I can fall back on my sponsors and and they provide me with a a, a monthly fee. So thank you to MJI, um, Constructing Growth and Mawson. So when I look back on your career, you've had such a big involvement in pushing women in sport forward. You know, you're the first ever British female boxer to qualify in the Olympic Games. You brought bronze medal back to Liverpool. What was your reception like when you got home? I've said this many times before, but I am lucky to come from from a city where the people, the press, and everything else, and my coaches, you know, the club, have always been very supportive of my career. Um, I've never really had any negative stuff said. I've never really had any anything bad really. Um, they've, I've always been well supported, um, and well received as well. So it's always it's always great great to win things and be the first. But I don't think you. You understand what you did until you, until you leave the game and you look back, or or like I go to I do a lot of work in schools and you know kids kids say oh I remember and you know how good it was and I I took up boxing because of you and and things like that so you never really you never really seen where you've because when you're in that time you're just so worried about uh, results and 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 yeah and just winning that you don't really take time to sit back and reflect on what where you've actually came come from and what you actually did did you ever feel under pressure to remain undefeated um i think as a, a high performing athlete you 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 never want to lose um you always want to go and you always want to win you always want to be the best i remember um savannah marshall in the amateurs hadn't hadn't lost and it was coming up to the the world championships and there was so much she felt so much pressure added only by herself because of that that zero and i think and the same with Clarissa Shields in the same world. Like when she lost, she thought like it was it, boxing was over. But it's just it's just a number, you know. There's very few boxers that make it to the end of their career, especially in amateur, without a, a loss, even in professional. Um, you know, in Great Britain, the only one third person I can think of at the top of my head is Carl Zaghi, and how many boxers have come out of Great Britain before then? So. You know, Mayweather in, in in America. There's very few Marciano. There's very few throughout history that get make it to the end of their career without suffering a defeat. And I think it's not the pressure that people put on you necessarily. Sometimes it's the pressure you put on yourself, and you you just want to be undefeated, and you can still be great and and and, and be defeated. From your first Olympic Games, have you seen a difference in attitude towards female boxers? I think from the Olympics, we always knew as females competing in the sport that once once people seen it at its highest elite level, um, that would they'd be more susceptible to accepting it. And I think that happened, but not only that, young females who was interested in boxing but didn't really have no one to look up to, they started seeing women be successful. I think it was only us in cycling um, that was the two most successful uh, teams. People, Young people then could see females being successful in the sport and I think after that boxing had like a 67% increase in female carded girls because you know you got the transfer over from other sports as well that maybe were in Olympic ones so if people were transferring sports 
um, people got to see it more. It was on a big public thing. It was a big success. It was very highly skilled and there was no difference for the men, which is something we knew all along. We just needed the world to kind of get on board with it. So you come from quite a sporty background. So your sister is a professional football player and you also had a football scholarship in America. So how did you make the jump from football to boxing? The jump um, from football into boxing was a total accident. Um, I had an injury which meant I couldn't play football anymore. And when I came home, you know, I, I kind of lost my way a little bit. I fell out of love with sports and people don't realise how social sport is. Um, I'd lost a lot of group of friends. I'd put on a lot of weight because I hadn't done any sport. Um, and after a year of like floating in and out of jobs and just really wasn't motivated to do anything, I thought, you know, something in my life needs to change. So I started going to my uncle's karate gym just to train by myself. And um, there was a woman that always like looked after it for him when he wasn't there. Um, and she always used to see me training by myself. She was like, oh, you should come along to the women's only nights at the local club. And I was like, oh, boxing, I don't really fancy boxing. don't want to get punched and all that stuff that people think of. And um, she was pestered me and pestered me and pestered me. And eventually I thought, you know what, just to shut her up, I'm going to go. And I went and that was to the Rotunda and that was 15 years ago and I'm still here now. So. It was a it was a great move and you know people think with boxing you you gotta get in get get in and get in a straight spot and it doesn't work like that um there was a, a a long process of training and you know wanting to fight not everybody wants to fight you know some people just do it for fitness you know do it to be social and for all them reasons I said before and it was probably the best decision I ever made the transfer from football was a little bit different obviously football's a team sport but I, I remember I was always frustrated sometimes when. I pride myself on always giving 110% and sometimes on the football pitch I felt like others wasn't um, so that used to frustrate me and I think boxing just, just came naturally because you know it's all about yourself and it, even though it is an individual sport you still train as a group with, with a group of people so um, but all the results depend on, on, on me I don't have to rely on, on other players to, to, to make me successful and I think I think that was the benefits of, of boxing compared to football. So before lockdown, you spent quite some time training at the Next Generation MMA gym. You sparred with UFC flyweight contender Molly McCann. Is there any possibility that you could maybe enter the UFC world? Um, I think, you know, and you, you can never say never with, with, with anything. You know, opportunities and doors open up all the time. Like I say, I've come from football, got injured, and that was the, that was the clo closed door in one thing. And then the... The opportunity to box opens another door so you've got always got to take your opportunities and if, if it comes uh, uh yeah you know and I, I don't think there's a boxer that wouldn't say they'd love to have a go at ufc obviously it's a whole different heap of skills and um techniques and stuff that you'd have to learn but i was going along and i was really enjoying it and you know molly's a good a good teacher and a good guide as well um but yeah it's tough and you know i'm one of them armchair fans when it comes to ufc where I sit there and I think, why didn't you just do that? Why didn't you just do that? And obviously you realise when you're actually there, that one thing that you just do that ends up to 20 things where you're in a chokehold. So yeah, I've, I've learned a lot more and I, I respect it a lot more as well since, um, since having a go. So you became a mum in 2015. How did that change boxing for you? Kind of, how did you get back into it? The change back from after having the baby, to be fair, there, there was no continuation of the GB programme for, for, for women who wanted to box but carry on. So once I decided that I was ready to have a baby, it was kind of just meant the end of my amateur career. Um, I was offered by by the team to come back, but you know it, it would mean me relocating to Sheffield, which is not something that I wanted to do. I wanted to be close to my family. Um, and it's tough when you're a first-time mum. Um, I think you're so focused on everything being right and being perfect that you kind of forget about your own routine and, and you're just solely concentrating on, on the baby's routine. And I, and I was doing that and she had her routine then. And then when it came to me, it was like, time, well, I'm ready to go back to work. You know, she's in nursery a couple of days a week. And I was like, what what do I do with myself? And then, then the opportunity came to, to go pro. And I, I was like, well, what is stopping me? I had to think about the barriers and speak to a few trainers and you know it's it's, st it's still a sport but it's business as well it, it was tough them first few weeks are tough I'm a lot heavier you know I hadn't boxed for two years and mentally I was just in a different place you know 
when you're when you're on GB and you're an amateur, you you know you're focused on on making weight every every time you're in camp. You you focused on the next tournament and being that one person selected to go. And then it's all, it's all about the focus is about you. And then you you become a mum and then this focus is on this this little this little ball of energy that just wants to eat and sleep and cry. Um. So yeah, it was it was it was it was a mad mental change and 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 emotional, but. Physically, your body can do anything, um, as long as your mind's with it, and that's that's basically where we got to with Joe. And uh, um, he said, "Come along to a few training sessions, see how we go." And we discussed the weight. I I said one weight, he totally declined it and said another. And then here I am, boxing a super feather now. So yeah, as I say your body can do anything as long as your brain's with it. So does she watch any of your fights, and does she want to follow in your footsteps and be a boxer when she's older? My little girl has seen um, some fights on on TV and she's seen sometimes when I've been on the news reports and uh, she's watched herself back and she's made up that she's on telly. But to be honest, um, when it comes to sport, and it, she's not she's not really that interested in anything that I do, but she absolutely loved going to the World Cup and, and watching my little sister uh, play. And, you know, she could be at the match and make as much noise as she wanted and had a drum and a, and a horn and... She was looking around and she, like she seen the crowd and uh, she she had an amazing time and a couple of days after being there she was still chanting all the you know the England songs and ch 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 chugging away down the street and that was amazing to see because it was like her first bit sporting like moment that she was she's like mom I want to be a footballer I want to be a footballer like Anthony Nikita I said okay but we've got to practice so you know that keeps it that keeps it going and it was it's it's nice it's it's a a, a nice thing that it's not just a random person that she is idolising that it is actually her auntie as well so that's it's really good yeah i would think it's pretty cool to have an auntie who is a is a professional footballer so what legacy do you want to leave behind in the boxing community um that's a tough question i don't particularly want to leave any legacy if i'm honest i think legacies are made themselves and people will already have like a, an opinion on what, what your legacy will be anyway uh, you've got really nothing to do with your legacy. You can just be the best person and athlete that you can be. Um, but I would like to think that from, you know, the struggles that we went through and the hurdles and barriers that we had to kick through and knock down and climb over, that it, it something we did made made it easier for women behind us. You know, um, Jane Couch fought the British Boxing Board of Control, so so we could, you know, we didn't have to do the same thing and we could compete and be recognised as a sport and and be be female boxers because it wasn't recognised before that and I'd like to think that you know all the strives and things that we've done for England getting in the Olympics competing in the Olympics you know that that all makes it easier and fun and better and, and you know like I say just hurdles that we've climbed over have, have made it easier for, for women behind us coming through and younger females in the, in the sport. So since the Olympics you've done a lot of work with children all over Liverpool why did you start coaching and mentoring? I've always done things within the community and I've always been close to um, a lot of local schools. Um, I've always gone in. I just think if you've got, you know, something positive and a motivational thing to say, that you should use it and you should be positive and constructive in, 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 in what you're going to say and helping, the, as I say, young people, younger people come through. If you have that influence, whether you're a male, female, it doesn't matter. You know, I think also that sports taught me a lot of things that sometimes either the classroom didn't or that I just didn't receive it in the way that it should have in the classroom. And I think, you know, they're skills that you can take through to life. You know, I'm, I am motivated I'm on time. I can work as a team. I can work by myself. I'm honest. I'm, you know, I'm all these things. And that, that that's something that employers would look for. So you're not just creating an athlete, you're creating life skills that you can use on further in life. Throughout your amateur and professional career, what would you say your most memorable fight has been? I think um, for me, amateur career, it, there's loads of fights for loads of different reasons. I think, you know, obviously qualifying for the Olympics had been a dream that I'd had since I was four years old and to be able to get out the ring and like go and share the, the moment with my family, that was that was special. And it's, it still like gives me goosebumps thinking about it. Also competing in the Olympic Games, not only winning against um, Queen Underwood, but having the the record for the loudest noise in the whole Olympic Games with Katie's. I think that's, you know, they're, they're, they're moments that you don't forget. Also 
coming back my debut just to be back and have that feeling again and you know there was a few hurdles again that I'd have to climb but I, I'd made them and and you know just to prove to people like just because I was a mum didn't mean anything you know you can you can be whoever you want to be I'm just I, I'm just a normal working mum but my job's a bit different so you know to come back and dust off all that that rust and have a good debut that was that was amazing and as, as well to be working with a new team and a new coach it was it was good it was a good feeling to be back so you just mentioned your fight with katie taylor in 2012 would you want to fight her again or is there anybody else you'd want to fight for that title spot yeah i think i, I think i'd be lying i think i'd be silly to say that i didn't want katie you know there's the certain females out there at the moment who are um you know they're the big fight um my big fight at the moment is Teddy Harper. Without beating Teddy Harper, I don't get any. You don't progress to fight another world title if you've lost one. You know you've got you've got to be who's in front of you first. And I think with that comes the Katies, comes the Brockhouse, comes Clarissa Shields for the heavyweights. You know certain people in certain weight divisions are are the big fights, and it's always the ones with the belts who doesn't want to fight for the belt. You want to prove that you're the world's best. You want to be the best. You've got to fight the best and. Before the Katie's and before anything else, I've, I've got to fight the people who's in front of me, which is Teddy. And she's got what I want. And there you have it. Tasha, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for everything you've done and continue to do for women in sport. Thank you all for watching and I will see you on the next episode of Spin Your Jaw.